Okay, so it's sharing this. Yes, now I can see. Oh, thank you. This is my second coffee. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, thank but thank you. I'm sure I need as much of it as I can get. <laughs> Seems to be working. Mm -hmm. Ready? Yeah. Well, it's an absolute pleasure for me to welcome and introduce Jane Setter. Um, Jane is a professor of phonetics at the University of Reading. She's the co editor of several books, including the Cambridge English Pronunciation Dictionary. And she has many research interests. Um, She's well known for her work on pronunciation of British and Hong Kong English, uh, but also <laughs> one of her interests is in speech processing and atypical speech uh, or special populations, and that includes Williams syndrome. Uh, the title of Jane's talk is Analyzing Prosodic Features of Spontaneous Speech. Am I going to pass over to Jane now? Thank you. Let's see if we can get this camera. A more sensible angle. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. And hi, everyone out there in the whatever verse. Um, I'm going to talk about um, analyzing prosodic features of spontaneous speech, but I, I want to get you to think about the issues that are involved when we're actually collecting data for spontaneous speech as well. Um, and I will show you some of the work that I've done. I will admit that some of it is spontaneous and some of it isn't, just to get an idea. Um, but one of the things that always strikes me about um, the way that we look at data and we analyze data is that we tend to collect it in a way which is not 
natural. We're not looking at natural speech. And actually, speech is all about communicating. Um, this is something that Francesca was talking about earlier on in the, uh, in the sessions. So when we're speaking to somebody, we, we want to communicate with them. We don't normally talk into a vacuum. I guess if you're a YouTuber these days or an influencer on something, you may be talking into a vacuum. But you're actually trying to connect with somebody to get them to do something. So the idea is if I'm selling you cosmetics online, if I'm showing you how to put on your eyeliner, for example, or if I'm testing out products or if I'm doing a fashion shoot or if I'm taking you somewhere exotic, um, then I'm, I am actually trying to communicate meaning to you. And generally speaking, people do this in a way where they're interacting with others. So when we do a lot of speech research, we tend to get people in the lab and we do things in very odd conditions, which are not normal. Normal is a bit of a funny word to use, but um, they're not what we usually use speech for when we're, when we're out there in the wild. Um, and if we're going to analyze spontaneous speech data, we really need to think about how can we actually get data, which is, spontaneous or as spontaneous as possible and I'm talking about speech that's kind of generated online at the time that people are using the language rather than asking them to do something where we've got um, tasks where they have to read stuff for example. So I want to just think about the differences between the sorts of things that we're doing in a lot of our speech research and the sorts of things that we're doing when we are using speech and language, what we're using speech and language for, and how we can think about collecting data in a way that's as natural as possible, obviously realizing that there are going to be restrictions. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to just get you to think about the level of spontaneity of the speech data. Um, also the environments in which speech data is collected and how this might affect the kinds of speech that we're getting. Um, equipment for collecting data. Uh, what sort of equipment is there that you can use? Is there easily accessible equipment? Is it suitable for collecting speech data for doing research? Um, and some methods for analysing speech rhythm and some methods for analysing intonation. Now, um, we've had a couple of slides um, in, in, in the uh, workshop. I think the one I'm thinking of particularly um, was from Lawrence, who, uh, who showed a slide involving dinosaurs. And I have to admit, I do feel a bit like a dinosaur here um, because the things that I'm going to be looking at here are probably things that you know very well. Um, so it's unlikely to be new stuff. Um, but we can still think about these different sorts of measures. I'm wondering, actually, with the, with the intonation one, there's a chance that there's something that you are very familiar with and something that you're less familiar with uh, because of the sorts of domains that, um, that, I, that I come from, the sort of research that I do. Um, so just to say, my background is English language teaching. I came into phonetics through English language teaching, through pronunciation, through looking at how people pronounce English when they're learning it as a language. And then I got into being interested in um, global Englishes, so looking at the phonology of Englishes that are developing around the world. Um, and so that's been my background. And, and I've always been very much motivated by, okay, if I'm going to put this research out there, are people going to understand it in a way that they can apply it? And that's always been my interest. And uh, I, I think you'd be surprised how scary people find phonetics. Maybe you wouldn't be surprised by this, uh, but it does scare people and it really scares language teachers very much. Um, particularly things like suprasegmentals. Um, that is something that really worries language teachers. Okay. So um, if we're thinking about spontaneous speech, then we might be thinking about you know, people just meeting out there, having a discussion about stuff. Uh, we'd like to be able to collect this kind of data, so speech that was arising in these sorts of conditions where people are just um, having a, a nice chat, um, sitting by a lake in this case, um, having a, 
conversation about, I don't know, the life, the universe and everything. Um, and we'd like to be able to collect data like this if we're looking at spontaneous speech and really get into what's going on in the interaction. And there's been actually quite a lot of work on speech in interaction, talk in interaction, um, done by, by my colleagues at York University. What we often find is that we, um, we end up with um, collecting data with people reading speech, whether we're collecting it from children or from adults. And actually, after I'd um, chosen this picture, I was amused because the exercise book is upside down. Um, so, um, but often when we're collecting data, we have this situation where we're asking people to read stuff to us. And we have to ask ourselves, is, is that natural? Is that, is that what speech is like um, out there in the wild? So what do you consider to be spontaneous speech? What would count as spontaneous speech? Any, any thoughts on that? <laughs> wow. Go on, Francesca, what counts? <laughs> what seems very relevant to me is the intrinsic motivation for the act of speaking. It's coming from the desire of the person who is speaking, it's not being forced. Okay, so um, just in case anyone didn't catch that on, on Zoom, um, Francesco was saying that he thought it, it came from the intrinsic motivation from the speaker. So it was a, um, a desire by the speaker to communicate, not something that's, um, that you're told to do, for example, that you're instructed to do. Okay, and any other thoughts about that? Something that is not rehearsed in advance. Something that's not rehearsed in advance. Okay, yes. So we tend to think of spontaneity as being something that you, you're just in that environment and you have to do it on the spot. Yeah, okay, anything else? Yes? Yeah, there have been some notions that like, um, like a phonetics, I mean, not all phonetics, but like many phonetics have like a, it's from lead speech. It's so like a, we, like a phonetician, just like, like some, some, someone else here, uh, don't really know much about quantum speech, what's, what's happening in their in terms of what's happening. Okay, so we're talking about free speech and the fact that we don't necessarily know very much about that. I mean, it, it is difficult to analyze spontaneous speech. It, it's hard. I am not going to tell you that it's easy because it, it isn't. Um, because, you know, we, we kind of think of language and it's really interesting. When we learn to read and write, we, we automatically think of language as being complete things. We think of it as being sentences, for example, or we think of it as being clauses and phrases maybe, but we think of it as being something that is fully formed. Um, and it's not. When we're speaking from a spontaneous point of view, there are, um, th there's research that shows, for example, that we might have an intonation or frame that we want to fit something into, depending on which language we're speaking. But actually, I might never get to the end of that sentence, <laughs> I might never. I might pause, I might change my mind about where I'm going. So um, it's, it's difficult to, um, it's difficult to set up a circumstance in which you're going to generate that kind of language. It's not impossible though, and there are, um, research, there are research projects that have done this. So, so spontaneous speech, something that is, um, something that's from the, the will of the speaker. So I'm doing this because I want to communicate this with you, not because I'm being told to communicate this with you. It's something that I'm doing at the time, uh, online, on the hoof. It's not something that I am I'm rehearsing. Um, and it's something that I might find if I'm looking at it is in fits and starts. So I might begin something, change my mind about something, self-correct. Um, you might correct me if we're interacting, then I have to rethink. I might um, commit speech errors where I have things like uh, getting my intonation slightly wrong. Um, I might do something where I, um, where I change sounds around at the beginnings of words or where I make blends or any of these things or where I get hesitations. 
and so on. So um, those are the sorts of things we're thinking about. So if we're, if we're collecting speech data and we're thinking about the level of spontaneity, then truly spontaneous speech is the kind of thing that we were talking about. So uh, speech in the wild. So speech that's collected, uh, or well, not even collected, speech that I am producing because I am motivated to, to speak to you for some reason. Um, and often it is interactional on some level. Um, people rarely just produce language for the sake of it, although some people like to have fun with language by sort of trying things out in their heads and stuff. Um, there are people like that. And uh, we went to um, a talk by Stephen Fry. I don't know if people in everyone in the audience is aware of Stephen Fry, um, but he's a, a well known. Um, oh, I, I suppose he, he just does so many things, doesn't he? So he's a comedian and a, a presenter and a novelist and so on. Um, but when we were, when he was giving his lecture for um, the Babel lecture, the International Babel lecture for the 10th anniversary of Babel magazine, I can tell you more about Babel magazine if you're interested. He was saying that he just used to like to play with words, play with language, kind of think about them in his head and, uh, and that sort of thing. So you, you do get people that do this, but I would say that was unusual. Generally, if I'm communicating, it's because I have a want or a need or something, and I want to say that to you or communicate that to you so that you can then do something maybe for me, whether it's giving me something to eat or whether it's it's having a political discussion or something like this, you know, it's something that I want from you. So really spontaneous speech is the in the wild stuff. Um, now, if we're collecting speech data, we can try to collect this sort of stuff, um, which is not easy because the minute people know they're being recorded, their behavior often changes. Although, as we know, if we then kind of leave things running, you'd start to get the truly spontaneous speech again. Um, you often ask people to do something called an experiential monologue. Has anyone heard of this kind of thing? So this is where you say to somebody, um, tell me about, um, and the kinds of things that we've used in the past include things like a favorite childhood memory or your favorite toy or a really exciting adventure or something like that. So you just say to the person, tell me about this. And you're asking them to give them something of you in a way, you're asking them to talk about themselves um, and they're recalling something that they've done and, and talking about this. Um, now, interestingly, to some extent, well, I suppose to, to, um, to some extent, all speech is, is rehearsed in, in some way or another. But to some extent, the experiential monologue might be something that they have recounted many times before. So this might not be a new, new, new thing. Um, but the fact that they are telling you about it means that it's spontaneous in the way that they're having to produce it on the spot. They're not writing it down and then reading it out to you. So we often collect data like this where we ask somebody to talk to us about something. Um, very often, if it's uh, people who are um, in, uh, if, if we're looking at things like um, global Englishes, for example, then often you get asked about um, your experience of speaking English in another context or something. So that, that's something that comes up and people talk about these sorts of things. Um, okay, then we've got interactive tasks and I'll, I'll come back to this a bit later on. Um, I think Bodo showed the map task, for example. So this is where um, we ask people to get together, usually in pairs, but sometimes in, in larger groups, and we get them to do something that generates spontaneous speech. Um, but it's not something that they're doing because they particularly want to. It's something that we've asked them to do. So um, again, with the experiential monologue and the interactive tasks, we've asked the people to produce a particular kind of thing. So they're not doing something because they're motivated from any other um, kinds of ends. We get interactive tasks going on. Okay, now as we get sort of le less and less spontaneous, wordless picture books and story retelling. So again, this is something I'll come back to. Um, we can use wordless picture books, and often we use this when we're collecting data from children, um, because we want them to tell us a story. Um, and children have a frame for stories. They have, often have a schema for stories. And we find that stories 
um, in many ways are similar across cultures and obviously have cultural differences. So if we get children, if we ever get children to tell a story in English, what do you think they start with? Once upon a time. I don't think we have any storytelling tasks from children where they don't start with this, even if we didn't give them that, you know? Um, so I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this sort of thing later on, but the idea is not to give them the words written down, but to show a series of pictures. So we might use a word as picture book, we might use a picture task where they have to say what's going on in a sequence. Um, but we've got this kind of story retelling, or we might tell them a story through oral narrative. This is more difficult with kids because they often need to see things to remember what you're talking about. Um, but then we've got the issue with memory and recall and so on, if we're not using any, um, any pictures as well. Uh, but we might tell people a story and then say, now you tell me the story. And we get their version of it. So it's generated online but it's not exactly spontaneous because there are things that will come up in the story um, that have happened over again. Okay, and then we start getting to things like red passages. So red speech, where people are asked to read things out. And there are a number of different passages that we find used in phonetics. Um, does anyone know any of them? The North Wind and the Sun, yes, probably the most well known. Um, because it's used in the, uh, the handbook of the International Phonetic Association. Um, so for anyone out there who doesn't know what the North Wind and the Sun is, um, it's, I think it's an Aesop's fable, isn't it? Um, so basically, um, the North Wind and the Sun have an argument about which one is the more powerful. Um, and, uh, and then they see a man wearing a coat um, and they're talking, no, it's not wearing a coat. Is he wearing a coat? He is wearing a coat, isn't he? And they talk about whether they can get the, whether they can get the coat off the man. And the North Wind says, I'm much more powerful than you. And he starts to blow really strongly on the man. And the man basically just pulls the coat around themselves more. And then the sun comes out and the guy goes, oh, okay, coat comes off. So um, it's, it, that's the story basically. Um, and we have this in the International, the Handbook of the International Phonetic Association. This story is told in a number of languages, a number of dialects of different languages in order to capture um, mostly segmental variation, I, I would say. Um, but you do often get some comments as well about super segmentals in there. Um, so that's a very famous one. There are other passages. There's Arthur the Rat. I don't know if you know <laughs> Arthur the Rat. Uh, there's the rainbow passage, um, which is talking about when uh, in the rain, when the sun hits the water, you get the rainbow and so on. Um, and there are a number of passages which have been constructed by people who work in phonetics to try and include a range of different sorts of features. So the full range of phonemes and preferably allophones that you're going to find to see what's generated in a language um, and also thinking about uh, maybe using question and answer structure and so on to try and generate some other sorts of differences. So red passages um, are another one. Um, and then red sentences, so just sentences this time, just kind of here's a sentence, read this, uh, say this sentence in a particular sort of way. Um, and then word lists. Um, now, I'm not saying that none of these are of any use because obviously they are. If we want people to pay attention in detail to what they're saying, then word lists or sentence frames with words inserted in them are very useful and important. And I've used those on many occasions, many, many occasions when I've been looking at specific things where I want people to be paying a bit more attention to what they're saying. So I've, I've used these. Um, but they're not spontaneous. There, there is no way that a word list is spontaneous. And by putting a word list, a list of words into a sentence frame, you're kind of manipulating the kind of form that you want to get to some extent. So we might do it in order to remove the, uh, the nucleus from that word, for example, by having it obvious that it's somewhere else. We might do it for that, or we might want the nucleus to be on that word. So we have a particular kind of construction that has that. Has that. Um, so all of these have their uses, but probably the only one that we can really consider to be 
truly spontaneous is this one, where people are speaking for their own reasons um, with others because they want to communicate. And that is really what we use language for. So while it's easier to collect this sort of stuff, um, actually this is the sort of thing that's going to tell us most probably about communication in speech, about how people are using language to communicate meaning with each other, to negotiate meaning, um, to um, achieve observable outcomes through speech. And we might be getting into the realm of things like speech acts and so on. Um, so if I say, um, I promise to pay, then that's me promising. So that's a speech act. If I say something like, uh, I apologize, then I'm doing that. If I say, I'm sorry, that's not the same thing. That's not a performative act. So we've got those sorts of things coming in there as well. So all of this stuff combines in spontaneous speech. And we find that researchers that look at this stuff um, are really interested more in interaction than, than pretty much anything else. So one of my motivations for this kind of thing is because a lot of my work involves um, global Englishes, I'm interested in looking at whether differences in um, speech prosody, as this is a prosody network, um, I'm interested in whether differences in speech prosody um, are, are, are a difficulty for people from different cultures using English. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a very well-known um, core for teaching uh, pronunciation called the Lingua Franca core. This was developed by Jennifer Jenkins, and I'm not gonna talk about this in a lot of detail, um, but, but she says, actually, the only, well, two probably, maybe three, two things that matter are something that she calls chunking, which is dividing speech into meaningful units, so the intonational phrase, whether that's a sentence or a clause or a phrase, and nucleus placement in English. She said those two things are the most important for the communication of meaning in English if you're looking at this from a pronunciation teaching point of view. So she said tones, not important. She didn't find in any interactions that if people used a rising tone rather than a falling tone, that it was a problem. Um, and of course, we, the other thing that goes together with that is word stress. So where's the stress in the word? Because if the word stress is not where expected, then the nucleus might not be where expected and that could be something that causes problems. So really getting this down to a very discrete level, those are the sorts of things that should be looking at. Okay, right, so if we're thinking about a, um, a table of spontaneity, then we'd say that this sort of thing was the most spontaneous and that sort of thing. Anything where you're asking people to read stuff, basically, is going to be um, the least spontaneous. Any questions about any of this? That's really about the category spot in practical terms. Because I mean, if we get people, say the phoneticians working in the phonetics lab, if we get people into the lab and then tell them to produce spontaneous speech, I mean, it is not less, well, it is still kind of less speech, so I would assume that it is not as natural as we would like it to be. No, that's and, it. I mean, you, you get observers paradox. I mean, if yeah, people, exactly. yeah, if people know that they're being watched, exactly. then they behave differently. And, you know, I, I've had students who have done, I had, I had a really interesting um, dissertation from a student who looked at, um, she looked at scripted dramas. Yeah. Then she looked at, we've got these kind of semi, weird semi-scripted drama things, things like uh, Geordie Shaw, do you know these sorts of things? And the only way is Essex. So, so it's basically, they, they get a group of people together from a particular demographic, um, and then they set scenarios up for them, and they give them a bit of a prompt, and then they just kind of let them, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I, so it's sort of semi-spontaneous, so they do it, they're, they're not there yeah. under their own motivation. So, there's something, so when we report the laboratory spontaneous speech, we yeah. just have to say semi well, yeah, you, you, you have to admit that. Yeah. But I think you, and of course the environment, that's something else I'll talk about in a moment. The environment is going to affect people. But if people get into a conversation, if you give them something to do, then they suddenly go off and talk about other stuff. 
And, and if you've done that, then you do get stuff that's more spontaneous. And then they might go, oh, hang on a minute, we're supposed to be talking about this. So you, you do get some, but it's how you can get the best kind of, of spontaneous type of speech. But yes, it's, it's if you put anyone in an environment where they're doing something that's not natural, then it's not truly spontaneous. And it's, it's hard to collect that kind of stuff. Unless you sort of wire, mic people up and you know just follow them around all day. So maybe they're just not ethically, you know, no. Peter yeah. Nowadays, yeah, yeah, that's another thing. Least, yeah. Okay, so I've talked about um, Wordless Picture Book. This is Frog. Where are you? Um, also known as the Frog Story. It's used a lot in speech and language therapy. Um, so there, there are many, many studies that have used this. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because in speech and language therapy, we're often collecting data from children. Um, and children don't tend to have much to say if you're trying to collect data from them. They can clam up totally unless they want something. Um, so we've used this in a number of, of different studies to look at features of, um, of speech. Um, and and it's, it's not truly spontaneous because clearly if you're asking somebody to do a, a story task then you're asking them to do a story task you're not just having a discussion with them about something um, but it is them narrating the story for themselves after a kind of run through so what what we normally do is um, we have the book um, it's just pictures so you can see some examples of it here um, I'm not sure that this story is ethically sound anymore. So what happens is the boy has a frog that he keeps in a jar in his room. I mean, obviously the frog is too big for the jar now, but this is the story. Um, so the boy has a frog in a jar and he also has a dog there. Um, and the frog uh, notices that the jar's open and the windows escapes and he, and he disappears. He, di he escapes through the window basically. Um, and the story is all about the boy and the dog's attempt to find the frog. So where, where, frog, where are you? Where, where's the frog? And this is just a couple of pictures from it, but they go through this whole process of looking for the frog. And there are a number of different adventures that they have. So you can see that there's some bees here, for example, in this slide. In, in, in the next picture, there's a beehive and they interact negatively with the beehive and the bees, the bees are all around them. Um, there's other wildlife going on. So there's things like deer um, and uh, what else is there? Um, but anyway, there's, there's various different things that they interact with along the way. Um, and at one point the boy meets a stag and he gets a ride on the stag and the stag takes him to the place where the frog is. And you can see this is the frog, um, the larger of the frogs there, that's the frog. And he realizes that the frog has a family um, and here's the frog and the frog's a partner and the frog's babies, um, you can see there as well. Um, at the end of the story, the frog parents give one of the frog babies to the boy. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, anyway, it's, yeah, what, what can you say? But that's, <laughs> oh, what are we teaching our children about if we're using this story? But it is really, really commonly used story. Anyway, so this is it. So what we normally do with this is um, we open the book, we say, I'm going to tell you a story. And then uh, we, we narrate the story. Um, and, you know, you might start with Once Upon a Time, but you might not, depending. Um, and it, it's kind of setting the frame of the story we're telling if you're going to do this. So you narrate the story to the child and then you say, OK, now I want you to tell me the story back. Um, now, we get a range of different lengths of story when we do this. So we get some kids who go, boy, a dog and a frog, dog does this, frog does that, end of story. You know, we get really short ones, maybe not that short, but we get quite short ones. And we get other ones where the kids get really engaged and they give us a load of description about stuff and so on, even stuff that we've not done because they've got really interested in, in the story. So we get quite a range of different sorts of speech doing this. It's not truly spontaneous, but because kids are used to stories and having stories told to them, it's a nice way of getting, it's a nice way of eliciting some, um, some spontaneous speech in the way that it's not generated um, by reading something. So there are no, uh, there's no writing at all in this, it's all images, it's all pictures. 
So we've used that quite a lot to um, try and get some speech from children. And as I say, it, it can be quite difficult to get kids to talk to you. Um, some of the research that we've done is with um, children from atypical populations. And uh, my colleague, Vesna Stojanovic, has been working with children with Williams syndrome for a, a very long time. And uh, Williams syndrome is, uh, Williams syndrome children are similar cognitively to Down syndrome children, but their language, the way they use language is quite different. So Down's kids tend to be quite quiet and not want to speak a lot. I mean, this is a very big generalization. Williams kids love to talk. So if we do this sort of thing with children with Williams syndrome, they want to tell us all the details. It's really quite fun. Um, anyway, so we, uh, we've used this sort of thing. Any, any questions about this? Yeah. So that's, that's that one there. Um, information gap exercises like map tasks. This is often where you have two interlocutors. I mean, particularly map tasks, you have two. Um, but you might have other sorts of tasks where you might have more than one and you're getting them to do things. And in this, it's more a case of negotiation of meaning. So rather than getting people to um, produce a monologue, um, like a story or something, in this one, we, we're trying to get them to um, negotiate meaning and we get conversational moves in this. So anyone who's done conversational analysis knows that you kind of get the openings up of the conversation um, and then you get these... Um, different sorts of adjacency pairs, maybe where people are just doing things that uh, you might do every day just to kind of say, hello, hi, you know, sort of thing, you might get that. So, and then you get the sorts of questions and answers and you get the um, intonation that goes up if you're expecting somebody to provide something and maybe goes down if you don't, so on. I mean, it's, it's dependent um, on the conversational type, of course, and the intonation type. Um, so the map task corpus, which is available from um, here, if you just type in map task corpus, you can often find it. Um, this is a, um, a set of maps and a set of recordings which have been made from map tasks, um, which was a project that was derived by colleagues at Edinburgh University. And uh, you can use these materials quite freely as long as you, um, as long as you say where you got them from in your research. Um, so I know that we've seen one of these already from Bodog, but this is, this is actually two maps. So we've got one map here and one map there. Um, and if we look at the maps, you can see that there are a number of different sorts of places, locations on the map. Um, and there is a trail around the map and there's an endpoint here. And uh, this, this is just one example. They're all very different, the maps. Um, there is some information on here that's not on there and vice versa. So they're not all identical. And the idea is that um, person A um, tries to get person B to draw the, uh, the way through the map um, by talking to them about it. So they don't show them their route. They have to tell them what the route is. Um, and so you get lots of kind of negotiations. Um, so first you have to start here and, and, and you might get people saying um, go south or go down or whatever um, when, you're, uh, when you're at this bit here. Um, and then, uh, you know, they might have to say, are they going to say something like when you get to this bit, go right? Or does that make any sense if you're coming there? That's from the left. So you might get a discussion about that. Or are we going to use east and west? It's not marked on the map, so they'd have to negotiate that they were going to use that kind of frame to start with. Um, and then they, uh, they, they, they do this task and they produce a particular sort of language from it. So you'll notice, for example, that on person A's map, there is a rope bridge here, um, but person B knows that there's crocodiles. So there might be a bit of jeopardy going on at this point. You know, are you sure you want me to walk over there? There's a crocodile on the other side. Oh, I haven't got a crocodile on my map. You know, you, you'll get this, this sort of thing. So, um, and, and you do get the sort of conversational moves of people negotiating something. Um, so you could use this kind of, of stuff to generate, again, it's not truly spontaneous speech because they're not doing it off their own bat, but it's a kind of task where you get the sorts of moves that you would expect in an interaction. 
And so we'd find from um, uh, an, an intonation point of view, for example, that you're going to get maybe rises and falls depending on um, what the speaker thinks the, the, the listener or the other interlocutor knows. Um, if you've got surprising stuff on the map, then that might generate different sorts of intonation patterns um, and so on. Does anyone use map tasks in, in their research? Yeah, you've used them. Um, now, the other thing about this is that once you have an idea of what a map task is, you can generate your own really easily. You could do more simplified ones, for example, if you're doing it with kids and you wanted something a bit more simplified, you could do that. Um, we've also got to some extent to think about the cultural issues here. Um, so this is kind of based on, I mean, I look at this and I see safari and banana and, and giraffes and stuff like that. And I think this must be tropical. Um, but, you know, there might be um, situations where um, somebody wouldn't understand what something was. So you need to make sure that the features on the map were something that made sense to the person using it. So do they know the vocabulary if they're um, from a, a learner background, for example? Would they know what spring box were um, at the top here, for example? Would they know what they were? Oh, there's no spring box on this map. So this person might say, mind the spring box, and they'll say, what spring box? Um, so would they, do they know what all of these things are and so on before they do that? So it's important to make sure that you're using maps that the, um, the interlocutors um, understand and can follow. Okay, so environments. Uh, the wild, uh, we've seen uh, the picture of people just kind of chatting, uh, which is uh, the, the kind of thing that we like to collect data from, but there are ethical considerations and there are always ethical considerations, of course, with any data that you're collecting from people. Um, so you must ask. And this one can be particularly tricky because if you mic somebody up and say, you know, we just want you to kind of walk around for the day and talk to people, then what about the people they're interacting with? They'd have to kind of get details from them. They'd have to tell them beforehand that they were being recorded. Is this going to affect the way that they produce the speech? Um, what's gonna happen here? But we can't actually do um, data collection in the wild very easily for that reason, because you just don't know who people are going to be interacting with. So um, you could collect something and say, I'm going to maybe low pass filter everything out that's from somebody else, but you've still got their patterns in terms of super segmentals if you do that. So you'd have to think very carefully about how you were going to set this up if you're going to record data in the wild. Um, okay, outdoors data collection. Great fun. It's a windy day and all you can hear on the mic is <laughs> Okay, if you're collecting data outdoors, you, you really need to think very carefully about these sorts of things. So how are you going to get outdoor data that you can use? Is there a lot of noise going on in the background from somewhere else? Actually, even indoors, is there air conditioning on? Um, I, I got a grant when I was working at Hong Kong Polytechnic University for a soundproof room and they insisted on putting an air conditioner in it. <laughs> so, you know, we said, can't we come up with another way of doing this? But they, they wanted one of these sorts of things in. So it was hard. It was hot, I'll admit that, but it was, a, it was a problem. But anyway, outdoors, what other sorts of noises might there be? Or even if you're in a room with somebody and they've got the window open what other sorts of noises might be happening. So we, we had some great data collected from um, mothers and, and, and uh, children just round the, round the table in, uh, well, I'm trying to remember where it was, I think it was Polish data. Um, and uh, one, one of the families had the window open and there was a blackbird outside and pretty much all we got all the way through was the blackbird. So, um, you know, that, that may, have, may cause a problem. Um, so the participants' home environment, now this can vary a lot from culture to culture. So um, if I've got students who are collecting data in the participants' home, a participant's home environment, then I'll always say quiet room, preferably away from a main road, so at the back of the house maybe, unless the main road's at the back of the house, so try and think about where, and as many soft furnishings as possible, um, because these will absorb the sound. Um, if you're in a, an environment like, um, like I was in Malaysia for a little while, 
People's home environments do not usually have a lot of soft furnishings. They often have uh, floors, so they'll have stone floors or tiled floors. They, they don't often have curtains. Um, so you're in a situation where you're gonna get quite a lot of noise. So you need to get people to think about if they're going to record at home, um, where would be a good place to do this and how they can fill the room with soft furnishings maybe, or um, toys, if they've got lots of soft toys to do that sort of thing. Um, but you need to get the participants to think about this kind of thing. Um, so a quiet room, generally I've recorded stuff in my office in the past when it's quiet, and then you get a lawnmower going by outside. Um, but a quiet room is um, a kind of place that you can choose. And again, as many soft furnishings as possible. Um, and then we've got sound treated rooms. And, and these can vary from kind of studio type areas to proper anechoic chambers. There's quite a lot of variation here. Um, and of course, an anechoic chamber is the perfect place to collect speech. Um, but it can be a bit intimidating. Um, and so, yeah, finally, a, a soundproof room or an anechoic chamber. So this is the kind of most natural sort of environment just out there anywhere, pretty much. And this is the least natural. So the wild, it might be really nice just to collect some data from people who are sitting there having a coffee, having a chat outside. But, you know, there might be all sorts of road noise from this is in Amsterdam. So there might be a road next to the canal. So you might get that people on bicycles. You're going to get people coming by on pleasure trips on the canal. So um, there are a number of challenges to doing this sort of thing. And also, how do you make sure, I mean, you could use quite directional microphones, but how do you make sure that you're not incidentally picking other people up that end up on your data? You need to think about these sorts of things. Um, and this is the anechoic chamber at UCL. It was, I think they might have refurbed it since then. Uh, these rooms are really weird. How many people have actually been in an anechoic chamber? Yeah, they, they are dead. You go, you go in and it's like, oh my goodness, it's just dead. Um, so all of this material on the walls is designed to stop the sound bouncing around. So you don't get reflections off anything at all. Um, and uh, in this case, you can see that they've got um, the microphone that they're using here is set up at a very specific distance. So we want to make sure that we keep them, the speaker away from the microphone by this and the next speaker that sits down needs to be in the same place because then we can do something sensible with, um, with intensity. Because if, if you're trying to collect data in the wild, then measuring the intensity is very hard indeed. Um, but in this sort of situation, if you wanted to get intensity readings, you could get that. Um, now, it looks like this person's going to be reading something because there's a screen up there. Um, but we did actually do uh, the recordings for John Wells' um, intonation book in the anechoic chamber in, um, uh, at UCL. It was, uh, it was in the Gower Street um, buildings. We were around there, not, not, um, not Charnable House. And uh, I was doing it with a friend of mine, somebody I've known very long. We did, we did the, the, the things that we were told to read out for the materials for the book. And then we sort of started having a chat and then we started giggling. And he said, I had to delete most of your stuff because you were giggling so much. So we did, there was some spontaneous speech in there, but that's probably because we're used to sitting in these sorts of environments. So if this is not a normal environment for you, you're not gonna get very spontaneous speech. So while we're on the topic of ethics, how many people have collected data from kids, from children? Okay, yeah, I've got some, a couple of hands at the back and you, you've done it too, and you've done it. Okay, collecting data from children is a minefield um, and it's also actually very hard um, because they're like, no attention span at all. That's, you know, again, a gross overgeneralization, but we do have to think about how we can get ethical consent from, uh, from children. And um, in the past, what has happened is we've just asked the parents. So if the child is under a certain age, we've said, is it okay to collect data from your child? And they've signed it off. Uh, but these days, that's not enough. So these days we're being told we have to get some kind of consent from the child. Uh, so obtaining permission to use child data, we have to ask the child where possible. If the child is over 12, we now have to get a signature from the child. 
Um, and agreement has to be obtained in all cases. So just a nod of the head is fine, as long as it's been observed by somebody else that this has happened, if the child is younger than that. And this is a kind of, it, this is the sort of thing that we've got on, um, on ethics forms that we've used with children. And in some cases you have to kind of narrate it and point to the picture. Um, so we collected data, um, we did a, um, a artificial grammar learning task where we were interested in whether having access to some elements of, um, of prosody um, enabled the children to learn the language more easily. Um, so uh, we had this, this narrative. So this is a story about a magician learning his spells. We'll ask you to look at some pictures. You will look at a computer um, and answer some questions. And we showed them an image of the computer so that we know what we're talking about. Although I, I, this looks like a, a Mac from the, from the 80s, but anyway, um, probably not from the 80s. Uh, we'll ask you to wear headphones. And another magician appears. He's been learning the spells that you've been listening to. Sometimes he gets them right, sometimes not. You decide if the spell was right or not. Um, it won't take very long to do this. So we've got a clock face for that. And you can stop if you don't like it. Um, so do you want to do this? And then the child can say yes or no. Well, they can point if they want to, to the yes, the tick or the, or the no, the cross. Thing. So they can do that as well. Um, we've never had one point to the cross, I have to say. We haven't had any child that said they won't do it. And I don't know if that's because genuinely they're not pointing at the cross or because they feel they have to, I don't know. But we haven't had anyone who's actually pointed at the cross or said no or refused. Um, and then we have thanked them for doing that. Um, we also have to do this if we have vulnerable adults as well. Um, and we're, uh, we're talking about whether we've got people from the kinds of populations that we've collected data from, so Down syndrome, for example, but also if we're collecting people, um, data from people with Alzheimer's or something like that, so elderly people um, or people who have aphasia or something, we need to, to do the same kind of thing just to get as much understanding as we can um, before we collect the data. So for vulnerable adults, a signature is required as usual from a family member legal guardian equivalent. And the vulnerable adult signature should be obtained where possible. And if not, then we need to get verbal consent. Um, so that's just a couple of things about that. And I'm, I'm sure if you're collecting data, Philip, is this the sort of thing that you would do? Philip, is this the sort of thing that you would do? Yeah, yeah, so it's kind of... Um, Yeah, yeah. It, it is really challenging. If you want to collect data from kids, do it because it's fascinating. But it's hard work. Um, it, it's uh, ke keeping kids of, of a particular age on track is, is interesting. Uh, but again, I mean, it depends what you're doing. OK, so we had a bit of a chat about equipment the other day. So you can use your laptop if you want to collect data from your baby. That's great. Uh, but you can use your laptop to do this. There are a number of different programs that you can download for your laptop. Um, you can get a, a reasonable condenser microphone for your laptop. You need to, again, think about the environment that you're in when you're collecting the data, but you can collect data directly onto your laptop. Um, there are a number of different voice recorders. This is just an image of a, a Tascam one. I've got um, Eddy Rolls. I don't think they're making them anymore, um, but Zoom was a, a, a name that um, Abby had mentioned. Um, Road also produces, Rhoda also produces some, there are a number of different ones, but you want one that kind of looks like this. Um, they often have microphones on the top, so if you're kind of whipping it out, you could do it that way, although that would be problematic from an ethical point of view. Um, but also they often have um, headphones um, and mic sockets, and you can use those as well. Is that a question? So some quick question, because of the ethical concerns and data protections, now we are asked to somehow like, uh, secure the electronic device and for storage. So, are you aware of any devices which have a good recording quality and the um, secure way of lack of the data? Yeah, I, I, I don't actually, because generally speaking, we, we've we promised to be um, ethical with it and make sure that we record it onto or we save it in a password protected area yeah. i'm not i'm not aware of any that do that does, does anybody know any devices that actually you'd have to password so there'd be something that you'd have to do to access this actually on the recorder does anyone know any of those so my problem was that it is okay if the recording 
takes place at the university yeah. because it is secure. Yeah. Or if I'm going on the field work, yes. I'm supposed to <laughs> take a device yeah. to allow us the data to be like Yeah, that, that, that's problematic. So who where where's that coming from? Just out of interest. Okay. We've we've not had that from ours. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're supposed to, we, we just have to say that we'll be responsible with the data and, and that we, we move the data immediately yeah. onto something like a password protected computer. So, so I think there is a device which is approved by N NHS, for okay. instance, but I think that is more for transcription rather than genetic. Yeah, coding. yeah, so they might not be very high quality. No. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to know yeah. more about that. Because I think that can be a problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, fortunately, we've not had any difficulties so far, but if this is coming, then yeah, um, I, I, I kind of understand it. But on the other hand, I mean, it's, it's getting a bit mad, isn't it? Seriously. Anyway, um, you can also, to some extent, use your phone. Um, it may depend what it is you want to analyse. Uh, we were talking about whether phone quality recordings, and you can get a programme apparently that, that, is, well, that will help you to make really good quality recordings on the phone or we'll make sure that the settings are, are high or you can do that on your phone. Um, it kind of depends what it is you want to look at. And we were talking about whether you needed something for a particular kind of, of speech event. And I think the thing that we were most concerned about was if you had something like, I think it's primitives that Aviad was talking about where it's very, very high frequency and there might be a problem. So you may find that you can collect data on your phone, um, but it, it, it does depend what you're gonna do with the data really, how you're gonna analyze it because it will compress it otherwise. And what we don't want is compressed data because it takes out too much information. Uh, but again, it might depend on what you're doing with, with the data. Um, so we need high quality data. Now I was always told to record at this level, um, but following discussion, um, do we need this level of quality? Um, it can depend on the intended analysis, what it is you're intending to look at. So maybe for prosody research, we don't need it recorded at this, this higher level. Um, so it's important for intonation, but you might only need 20 kilohertz rather than 44.1, for example. Um, and I was always told to record mono, um, but there are stereo recordings out there and you may want to have one person on one channel or one person on the other. So you need to think about what suits your research really. Um, so it, for rhythm, you may find that you don't need as much information depending on what you're doing, how you're dividing your speed. Um, and it can also be dependent on access to equipment. So again, if all you've got is your phone, use your phone, use what there is, but bear in mind that there might be difficulties with the data that you've collected depending on what you want to do with it. Um, if you can, make sure you mic up your speakers. Um, I've used the Pell mics, for example, if people are sort of moving around. Um, you can use unidirectional mics if you like. Um, the level of equipment can vary quite a lot here. Um, and here's some suggestions for software. So Prat, I mean, I don't know anyone who doesn't use Prat or doesn't know how to use Prat. I, I, I'm, I'm fairly new to Prat, I'd say probably in the last five years, to be honest, I wasn't using it that much before, um, but it, it's, it's not the most intuitive program in the world, um, but once you're used to it, it's fine. And you do have to bear in mind that it does weird things on occasion. And I'm always telling my students to look at the data and listen to the data and see if that makes sense what it's done. Um, Okay, there's something um, called, uh, oh, I missed the bracket off here. There's something called Speech Filing System, and this is available from UCL. as a program developed by UCL, which kind of does the same sort of thing. Um, this only works on um, Windows machines. It does not work on Mac, sadly. Um, then there's WaveSurfer. I have no experience of WaveSurfer. I used X-Waves many, many years ago. Um, but I've not used WaveSurfer, but I do know people that like this, and I think it's because it's like X-Waves, so, uh, but I've, I've not used this. And then Audacity, not a speech analysis program, but quite handy for recording stuff directly onto your computer, and then you can edit it quite easily if you want to in, in Audacity. Um, I used to have something called Cool Edit. Does anyone remember Cool Edit? I loved Cool Edit. Windows shut it down. Ah, really <laughs> annoying. 
but it was great. I mean, you could do all sorts of fun things with Cool Edit um, that you can't do with Audacity. And again, Audacity, it's sometimes not particularly intuitive, um, but it's, it's okay. Anyone got anything else that they'd recommend particularly? Yes, but I, th I think even with aud audition, they, they've kind of, they, they're, not, they're not supporting it. Are they supporting audition? Because I, I had audition. And, and I don't, I don't think they're supporting it. Yes, yeah, but I think Adobe, I don't think they're supporting it. Um, I, I've still got it, and I use it on, uh, yeah, I, I use it, but I, I don't know what they're doing with it these days. But yes, this, this is the free version of that. So um, with um, Audition, you have to buy it. Um, but I think there might be a free version that's kind of limited. But with Audacity, you could just download it for free. And it's open source. Yes, what audacity is. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So remember all the conversations we were having about open source and open material and open publication. Audacity is your person for this. Yeah. That is um, uh, digital audio workstations that now we use to for making music. There's one of those that's of open source is called Reaper, and uh, it can be used for free. And the advantage that it has over you should buy the, the version, they let you uh, use the version without buying it. Okay. It costs like 60 bucks or 70. What the advantage that it has over uh, Audacity is that it can be scripted. Okay. So if you have batch processes. Audacity can scripted. Audacity, yeah. Should it be Python? No, no, With maps. Okay, so it is a reaper can be Python script. So okay. And how do you spell that? Uh, Reaper, yeah, like like the Reaper. R E A P E R. R -E -A -P -E -R. Yeah, so R R E A P E R. That's a program for music, but you can use it for speech. Okay, I've I've not used that. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, do you want to? No. Let's. Should we press on? Anyone who needs the loo, please just. <laughs> yes. Okay. Do you want five minutes? Yeah. Please. Okay. Let's have a short five minute break. I'd like to ask something. Yes. So you talked about ethics, and I was curious what to think. One is, um, of course, you should inform the participants that they're being recorded, mm -hmm. but is it okay if you do not tell them the exact purpose of collecting their speech? Um, For example, like we're, we're just lying and saying we're. Try to look at how you respond in terms of context, but actually we're looking at the phonetic. Yeah, it, it's a tricky one because you don't want to give people so much information that it affects the way that they produce the language. Yeah. So you, you have to kind of find the fine line. I mean, obviously you have to say, this is a research project, we'll be analyzing the speech. And, Try and find a way of kind of saying generally what you're looking at, but you are going to have to be a bit more specific than we're just looking at speech. And I think in the UK, they have to tick box saying, are you, are you going to use deception? So in that case, if you're lying, you are actually using deception. Yeah. Ah, so there is a whole protocol that you have to go through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then no, it's it's it's, it's, it's like quite it's scary. quite tight. Yes, I, I, so you yeah, so you can't tell them that you're collecting it for some other reason. You have to kind of give them enough information so they know what you're collecting it for in the UK. Uh, okay. Yeah. So is it different by country? It, yeah. Quite possibly. Yes. In the UK is the most strict. Yes. Uh, and I think other European countries are. I mean, if they are never relax it, it is only getting stricter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you know, strict is a nuisance on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's fair. We've got to tell people what we're doing, but you can you can word things in a way that say, we're collecting the data to look at this, but not tell them. Exactly. Well, not, not, not tell them something that will affect the way that they speak. So if you, ah. if you say I'm doing, if you tell them, well, I don't know, even with intonation, it's quite broad, isn't it? So I think you could say uh, this is a project which is looking at intonation, specific aspects of intonation in speech, and I'll be analysing your intonation. 
Um, if you say to them, we're looking at focus placement and I'm going to be looking at this, then that might make a difference. But again, they have to understand what it was that you were talking about. So you need to be able to explain that to them. Um, I, I, you'd have to find a form of words that covered that 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 didn't it's it's yeah for spontaneous speech it's working out what you can say that gives um enough information so that they understand what it is you're going to do with the data without influencing how they actually mm. produce it it's it's hard but you'd have to work out what you could say it's going to be different for every project so i can't give you a form of words uh -huh. but you'd need to think about or you know you could pilot it so you could have a, a consent form and then you can pilot it with some people and if you find that they change the way that they're speaking because of what you've told them then you need to think about how can you how can you tell them enough so that they're they are fairly agreeing to do to doing something but not have it affect the speech output so much that it would cause a difficulty for your findings. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Thanks. Is it possible to have a kind of two-stage consent process where initially you'd have a fairly general consent form and within that, say, at any time you can withdraw from this project. Yeah. And once you've collected the data, then contact everyone again and say, we would also like to use it for this. Please let us know if you consent to this use of it. So that actually, it's a slightly um, kind of false pretenses at the beginning. Yeah, no, I've, I've never come across anything that's oh, done that. Yeah, no. I actually have a similar question. And I think one good example for that is using the collective data of the perception test. So, Oh, okay. Well, no, I mean, we'd, we'd normally have to say we're collecting this data for blah, and it will then be used in a perception test and people would have to agree to that. So if you, if you want to use it again later for something else, you would have to get permission to use it for that. Um, the problem with that is that sometimes you can't find everybody <laughs> to get them to agree, but you, you would have to get another set of permissions. But I don't know if you could collect it without giving them enough information to start with and then say, can we use it for this as well? I'm not, I'm not sure. I haven't seen any. It doesn't mean that they don't exist, but I haven't seen any such two-step consideration. Actually, I'm a little bit warm. Okay, shall we? Um, I think most people are back. Before we finish, I might need to tap out to see what's happening. Okay, just one thing. Okay. Um, right, let's look at uh, speech rhythm and spontaneous speech. What methods are you aware of? For speech rhythm analysis, what have you used or what have you seen? What have you heard of for speech rhythm? There's, there's various different approaches and metrics. So what sorts of things? Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it depends on what you mean by rhythm. Okay. Yeah, it really yeah. So, but what sorts of things have you seen used? I mean, are you... I mean, some people mean by, you know, what some people mean by rhythm is a regularity. So we have tasks like speech cycling and then clapping mm -hmm. and then whether to kind of examine whether people kind of attend in a regular interval or something. Or we can do the auditory analysis. Okay. I'm, the yeah, I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about um, metrics and things like that. The metrics as in acoustic metrics like PBI. Yeah. Okay, so PBI is one of them. What, what else is there? What else have people heard of? Yeah. Proportion of the vocal leg intervals. Okay. And then there is a variation of the duration between either the vocal leg or consonant leg intervals mm -hmm. or the variation in the syllable duration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, there's lots of different ways of measuring it. So some metrics include PBI and RPBI. 
Uh, so these are normalized. So PVI is looking at the calic intervals basically, and, and our PVI is looking at the other stuff. Um, and then there's SPVI, which was um, looking at syllables, whole syllables, rather than just looking at the syllable nuclei. Um, then there's uh, things like um, delta V and delta C and percentage V. Um, and then we've got VARCO V and VARCO C. Um, and then we've got um, reviews of these. So the, this is a couple of reviews. I mean, the, these metrics have been reviewed by lots of different people, but um, Lawrence, who we saw earlier, has done a paper looking at different sorts of metrics. And my colleague, Rachel Ann Knight, um, has also done the paper looking, but there are other papers that have looked at these. And I mean, you know, some, some people are really happy with these and other people think they're rubbish and people have compared them to say, well, well if, do we get the same sort of outcomes? If we do, we run the same data with, with different sorts of metrics, do we get the same sort of thing? Um, so, but you, 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 can't, you, you usually see this sort of stuff. So if we're going to apply these kinds of things, we have to think about um, how we're going to actually prepare the data that we've got um, in order to do that. So pairwise variability indices, um, as I said, look at vowel intervals and um, intervowel intervals. And then this one is from syllable onset to syllable onset. And that was the Asim Nolan one. Um, and then here is the NPVI equation, um, which I just look at and go, ah. Um, but uh, the good news is that there are various spreadsheets and programs and all sorts of things you can download where you just throw your, your durations in and it will come up with the PVI. So that's great. Um, I don't want to be knowing about this, really. I'm quite happy to, if somebody's got a spreadsheet that they can give me that does this, I'm really happy to use that. Um, but it's, it's such a commonly used um, equation, I think. I see this all over the place. Um, and actually, this came out um, at exactly the time that I was doing my PhD, which looked at speech rhythm in Hong Kong English. And I was doing something different. And I thought, oh, no, does that mean I'm going to have to redo the whole thing? But actually, I didn't have to. I was very happy about that. Um, okay, so interval measures. So we've got the standard deviation of vocalic intervals or consonantal intervals. Um, and then we've got the proportion of spoken material comprising the vocalic intervals. So these are all things that have also been measured. Um, and then we've got the normalized versions of these two, the Barco B and the Barco C. Um, and again, there are things available that allow you to put your data in that will generate this um, for you. Um, so you don't have to worry. OK, so you've you've collected your data. I'm not talking about methods for collecting like the tapping and so on, because we talked about that. You've got your data. If you were going to apply a metric to it, what sorts of things do you need to do if you're going to analyze this lot? OK, I'm just going to take you through some ideas. So first of all, decide how you're going to label your data and stick to it. Make sure that you are very, very clear about where your intervals, things that you're measuring start and end. What is it that you're looking for? Um, so if you're using syllables, which approach, for example, maximal onsets, word level, morpheme level, which sort of level are you gonna use here? Because there are lots of different approaches to this. We adopted maximal onsets in the Cambridge English Pronouncing Dictionary to divide syllables. We weren't entirely happy with it for various reasons, but we were told we had to divide syllables and we decided to do that. If you look at John Wells's Longman pronouncing dictionary, he uses a different kind of way of dividing syllables. So you end up with something different, but you have to think about what, what is a syllable um, or where are you gonna do your divisions? If you're dividing things up in segmental terms, so if you're saying this is the end of the consonant and that's where the vowel starts, then what sorts of parameters are you gonna use? Um, so there are tricky things like approximants and diphthongs. So where do you decide one bit ends and another starts? You, um, you need to think about these things. And particularly because if you are doing this sort of analysis, generally you will need to get into rater agreement for a proportion of it. And they will have to know exactly what you did so that they can apply, um, they can apply that. Um, so this is an example from my PhD student um, now uh, no longer a student, uh, Dr. Sebina, um, who looked at speech rhythm in Setswana. And um, 
she um, was interested in whether the speech rhythm of Sexuana English bilingual children was similar to that of Sexuana monolinguals, because she was interested to see whether the English was having an effect on the Sexuana rhythm. She was interested in that. And she had um, 10 Sexuana English bilingual children and 10 age matched Sexuana monolingual children. Okay, now you might think that's not many, and it isn't but it was so difficult to get this data. It was really, really hard work. So this is what we went with. Um, and she did collect a fair amount of um, spontaneous speech for them. And in fact, she used frog stories. She collected frog stories from them. Um, so she used frog story monologues and then she looked at this, at this data. Um, so she used uh, NPVI and Valkovicia. Those are the two metrics that she uses as a comparison. Um, and she looked at vocalic and intervocalic um, intervals using Prat and extracted them using a Prat script. And this was a Prat script that was just available to download freely. Um, there are lots of these out there. You can access them via the Prat page. So just go there and it has a list of all of these different scripts that you, you can use. And she just took one of those and applied it after she'd done her segmentation and she followed the segmentation approach of Graba and Lowe because of the NPVI largely. Um, and these uh, say that inter vocalic intervals are the stretch of signal between vowel onset and vowel offset, characterized by vowel formants. Okay, so we're looking at the onset and the offset bit. These are the things that you need to pay attention to. So how do you decide? Um, and for example, Graba and Lowe say, um, that uh, they use generally accepted criteria. For example, fricative vowel sequences, they looked at the onset of the vowel um, and the onset of the second formant. So that's where they chose that. Uh, vowel um, voiceless fricative sequences were um, vowel termination where the noise patterns began. And then for the vowel voice fricative sequences, they looked at the onset of by frequency energy. So these were all the things that she applied when she was segmenting her data. And we've got a few other things going on here. Um, so nasal vowels, this can be a bit more tricky. Um, and then with um, initial glides, um, it, they excluded from the vocalic portions if their presence was indicated by clearly observable changes in formant structure or in the amplitude of the signal. Otherwise, glides were included in the vocalic portions. So they just kind of included the whole thing in there. So you can find um, agreed criteria and you can use those, or you can say, actually, I'm not happy with this. I'm gonna come up with my own, but you have to be very clear about what it is you've done and how you've measured things. Because with all of this kind of stuff, when you're labeling things, you do need to get inter-rater agreement that your measurements are reliable. So we're looking for reliability here. Um, and that is something that is vital. Just out of interest, um, just to see what she found. So we've got MPVI and Barco V here. She did find that there was a um, significant difference between the monolingual kids. So that's the, um, the MPVI for the monolingual kids was about 55. And for the bilingual kids, it was actually lower. It was about 40. Um, and then we've got a similar difference for Barco V. What she was thinking was that English speech rhythm would affect Setswana and that Setswana spoken by the bilinguals would be more stress timed. But actually she didn't find that. Um, she found it the other way around. It was kind of closer to a syllable times notion or syllable based notion. Um, and the way that she discussed this was in terms of um, child language development, because what we know is that until about age four, all kids are um, syllable timed, basically. Um, their rhythm is, is syllable based. And it's not until after that age that you start seeing these differences with the, um, uh, with the kids from languages like English, et cetera, where you've got this sort of stress timing. Um, and so she talked about it in, in developmental terms. So she said the reason that the bilingual English sets one of kids have a lower uh, PBI or a lower Varco V is because developmentally, they're still early on in the development of the, of the language. They don't have, um, they haven't developed it as much as the, uh, as the monolingual kids um, who are using it more often, basically. So that was her argument and discussion. She also looked at um, uh, penultimate syllable lengthening because that's a focus in Setswana, but I'm not gonna talk about that here. So this is what she found. 
Um, now, as I was saying, when I when I was doing my PhD, the MPDI came out and I thought, oh no, but actually um, my PhD was accepted and I have never seen anyone else take this. <laughs> so there you go, which either means it's rubbish or it's so novel, I don't know, anyway. Um, so I'm interested in how you can explain things to teachers. And quite frankly, metrics like PBI and VARCOV, they, they don't understand that. They don't, I mean, if you give them anything to do with pronunciation, they're already worried. If you say you have to apply this metric and give them a mathematical thing, then they're, they're gonna say, well, this, this doesn't help me understand what's going on. I don't know what's going on. So I was interested in if, when we're teaching about things like, um, uh, well, basically about international phrases, what sort of language are we using with teachers to teach them, to train them about speech prosody um, in English? So it was based on how language pronunciation teachers, English language pronunciation teachers, understand stress and rhythm from the sorts of language that they would see um, if, they were, if they were doing this. So I looked at speech rhythm in Hong Kong English and I compared the durations of um, tonic, stressed, unstressed, and weak syllables in Hong Kong English. And this is the kind of language that language teachers are used to. So um, they will know what a stressed syllable, a, a nuclear or a tonic syllable is, or a focused syllable, um, and they'll understand unstressed and weak. I mean, it, everybody knows what these are in English because it's schwa basically and everyone's scared to death of schwa um, but uh, it, it, this is this is something that the teachers um, will understand um, and I had 20 students at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University um, and I had um, a, an amount of speech from each of them and it was presentation data now this is semi-scripted so it's not truly spontaneous but they were not allowed to read from a script so there might have been some rehearsal going on there, but actually um, all they could have was note cards. They couldn't have sentences on the note cards. It just had to be sort of phrases maximum. Um, but they were supposed to give their presentation and um, with no visuals, they were just talking about stuff. Um, actually, I think we had images, but we didn't allow words. And this was just something that they did as part of their training. Um, they were in the construction engineering and management course. Um, and they had to be able to talk about the, uh, the diagrams and the engineering diagrams and what was going on there. So I had that sort of language. So it was kind of semi-scripted because it was a test and they knew they were going to do it. But there were loads of hesitations and restarts and corrections. So it wasn't like it was not, um, not entirely spontaneous. For the British English data, I, I didn't want to say we have to compare Hong Kong English with British English as some kind of standard. I just wanted to see what we did have because there's a lot of work on British English, but there was much less on Hong Kong English. So I was interested to see what the differences were um, rather than saying they must do this. What are they doing that's, that's not right? I wasn't looking at it from that point of view. Although if you're a pronunciation teacher, then often you are. You're saying that this is, this is the target um, rather than this is a reference. Um, so these are my results. So the red line here, this is the Hong Kong English. Um, so that's just language one. And language two is the British English in green. Um, and what we've got down at the bottom is the stress level. So we've got weak syllables, that's number one. Um, unstressed, stressed, and uh, tonic or nuclear there. Um, and this is the mean duration in milliseconds. And you can see that for um, the British English, there's much more difference between the weak syllables and the unstressed ones and the nuclear ones and the, um, and the stressed ones in terms of length. For Hong Kong English, we've got something that's similar, but it's not quite as different. Um, so that was basically what I, what I was looking at. And this, this was, if, if you listen to Hong Kong English, it does sound rhythmically different. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to look at it, just to see kind of what was going on. Um, all of these are, are significant, statistically significantly different. So that and that are, that and that are, etc. So they are each different from each other. The only one that's not is this one up here. So that's not statistically significantly different in terms of duration. 
So we've got this thing where the Hong Kong English um, data converges on the British English by the time we get to nuclear syllables, but in the other, for the other types of syllables, um, it doesn't. Um, and this is just the proportion of syllables according to stress level. Um, so in British English, that's the, the kind of lilac-y blue bar, you can see that it goes down in a very, very gentle hierarchy. It really was. I actually had my external examiner ask if this was real because it's so uniform. So the weak syllables, there were so many more of those than there were of the tonic ones. Um, and this is what we tell people. We, we say that schwa is the most common vowel in English. And it is, it really is in this data. In this data, you can see that. Whereas for the Hong Kong speakers, they had many fewer syllables with schwa in, but they did have them. It wasn't like there were no schwa syllables and many more unstressed syllables. And because this creates a kind of an imbalance, then this is gonna mean that the rhythm is the, the rhythm's gonna sound different. And for me, I thought if you're a language teacher, this is gonna make more sense than saying PVI 40, PVI 70 or whatever. Um, then, so this sort of thing um, made more sense to me. Okay, so that's a, that's a, those differences there are um, important. Um, we also looked at speech rhythm in, um, in non-spontaneous um, Hong Kong English. We basically used the sentences from Low Graber and Nolan's um, experiment looking at Singapore English, where you have full vowel sentences. So every, every, every syllable has a full vowel. So birds eat worms, for example as opposed to the birds of equal the worms where you've got the full and reduced sets. So we had full vowel sets and full and reduced sets. And we just used the Graber and Nolan examples. So we've got Hong Kong English, Singapore English and British English there. And uh, for the Hong Kong English, um, we found that there was an NPVI difference of 10. Um, for the Singapore English, there was an NPVI difference of six. That's the data from Low and Graba, and also the last one as well, the British English, the NPVI difference was 44.78. So loads of difference there, but not so much difference for the others. So you could say that the Hong Kong English was more similar to the British English than the Singapore English was. You, you could say that. But going back to this discussion we've been having about statistics. Grace works through huge pounds each Friday. Okay, so this is speaker five, and you can hear that speaker five makes a lot of difference between the full vowel set and the reduced vowel set. Speaker 10, let's actually go back and see if we can hear her again. Let's see if I can get that to play again. Oh, here we go. So this is this is the one where there's actually quite a lot of difference between them. Grace works through huge pounds each Friday. Grace is tired of nothing. Okay, so lots of difference between the sets. For speaker nine, however, this one here, there's not so much difference. Grace works through huge pounds. Grace works through. Sorry, I pressed it twice. Grace works through tired of nothing. Let's let's see if we can not get a harmonic one. Here we go. Grace works through huge pounds each Friday. Grace was tired of Matthew Freeman. So that's that's very, very similar. So you do have to look at the whole lot of the data because there was a lot of speaker variation going on here. So if we're considering the standard deviation, it's it's actually quite large. So by saying, by grouping everything into a kind of a one bar significance thing, we're not really seeing that we've got all of this variation going on among the speakers. And this, this depended on a number of different things. Um, including whether they spoke English a lot at home and, and that kind of thing. Right, if I press this again, I might get um, that speaker. Okay, any, and this was not spontaneous speech though. Any questions about any of that so far? Sorry, can I ask if you play again speaker five? Speaker five? Yeah. Grace works through huge pounds each Friday. Grace was tired of Matthew's Yeah, okay. Anyone want to hear of any of these again? Okay, yeah? Grace works through huge mounds each Friday. Grace was tired of Matthew Freeman. 
And there, there are a number of these. We just used them from the, the, the Low Graber and Nolan uh, paper. We just borrowed those and replicated it basically with the Hong Kong speakers because we wanted to see if it was how much similar it was to um, Singapore English. And Singapore English is there's less, even less difference, but that's if you look at everybody. Um, and and I, I was just struck by the amount of difference in, in these speakers, because there's just so much variation going on. We, uh, you know, we have some people where there seems to be uh, these two bars, for example, they're both up around the 60 mark. So even the full vowel set sounded a bit kind of like it had um, variation going on. Um, it was, it was, it's, it's always worth looking at all of the data <laughs> rather than just saying, hey, p-value out there, you know, that's the end of my story. Um, okay, let's go on to the next slide. Is it going to let me do that? Yes, that one. Okay. So analyzing intonation in spontaneous speech, what frameworks for the analysis of intonation are you aware of? What sorts of things have you seen for analyzing intonation applied to the speech to analyze it? What kind of thing? Sorry, Okay. Okay, yeah, anyone seen any other things? British tradition, IPO, and <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going to talk about a couple of things which are which are more down my end of the world. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of things out there for analysing intonation, um, and common frameworks that I'm familiar with are the tones and breaks indices um, approach from Silverman et al. and also Ivy um, Graber and uh, and colleagues use something that's kind of similar. But with tones and break indices, it's all based around high and low. And Graber and Nolan actually allow you to have a, a, a middle. They, they've got a kind of middle tone as well. Um, but they use a slightly different version of this, but it's a similar sort of thing. Um, and then the British system, which is what um, Heysan was just talking about. So for example, O'Connor and Arnold. Um, and then there's discourse intonation. Is anyone aware of discourse intonation? Yeah, okay. So this, uh, I'll talk about particularly these two, and then we'll spend a bit of time looking at that, because I think that might be the one that people are least familiar with, because I'm, I know Toby has been applied all over the place by all kinds of um, different research projects. So Toby is based on Janet Pierhumbert's theory of intonation, and it was developed by a team in the USA. Um, it's dubbed auto segmental metrical theory. Um, this is a website for it, but if you just look for Toby or tones and break indices, you will find um, the information um, about how this works. And uh, there are examples from lots of different languages. So I'm using English, but there are Toby systems for German, Korean, Japanese, I think this is called K-Toby. Um, so there are variations of this that, that have been used for different languages. Um, and there are also others under development all the time where people are trying to apply this to other languages. So this is the basic um, format, if you like, of uh, how you would label something. So we've got boundary toes. So is the tone high or low at the boundary at either end? Um, I think most commonly you see them at the end, but I've seen them more recently added at the beginning as well, but you definitely need one at the end here. Um, then we've got pitch accents um, using prominent syllables, and we've got high star, low star, low plus high star, uh, low star plus high, high star plus low, um, high plus low star, and then high star plus high. Um, so that's the kind of main, um, th th these are where you might say the stress syllables are, we'd use one of these on that. Then we've got the phrase accent, which is the direction of the pitch movement following um, the tone, and you can have a number of these. The last one is usually considered to be the nucleus. Um, but then we've got the phrase accent, and then uh, we have the boundary tone. So um, the intonation of a phrase has a tune, a metrical stress pattern, and in order for these to work as a phonology, they are governed by various rules. Um, and the approach, as I said, is based on high and low tones, and these are mapped directly onto the F0. Um, so if we had a sentence like this one, so um, 
that thing at the end indicates an international phrase boundary using the British system, the O'Connor and Arnold system. Um, and if I was to transcribe it like this using the British system, so this would be, I really like it, I really like it, when we've got a falling toe on our nuclear syllable there, um, we've got a head pattern that starts on the word um, really on the first syllable of that, it's a high head, and then uh, we have a low level tail at the end after this because that's a fall and then we've got an unmarked prehead. So that's how I'd analyze that in, um, in the uh, British system. If I was going to apply Toby to this, then I'd, I've got high star and then I've got high star and then it's a low boundary. So this falls to low and then we've got a low end. So it would look like that basically. And I could align that um, using Prats. So I can put this as a, um, a point here and just put them on there. And as I said, the last one is considered to be the tonic syllable usually. Um, and it's also usually considered to be the highest one, I think, and you have to use an exclamation mark if it's, if it's going down. But I'm sure you're very familiar with this. Um, so these are the different pitch accents. Um, and then, as I say, we've got this thing that indicates a down step um, there. So uh, has anyone trained to use Toby? Anyone use Toby? I know you've used it, Hoyong, haven't you? Anyone else used it? Yeah, okay, so there's lots of, um, uh, I think my favourite one is, um, well, we all know Mariana made the marmalade, let's put it that way, if you've done Toby training. Um, okay, uh, so these are the boundary tones, so that one's common in declarative sentences, and uh, this one is the pitch is ending high, moves up high and ends high, usually preceded by a low tone, and uh, it's equivalent to the British system rise if preceded by a low tone and then we've got these other ones where we've got um, lower rise and boundaries so this one's equivalent to a full rise or a rise depending on what comes before it and then we've got um, this one often preceded by a low which is um, equivalent to a rise fall or a level interestingly um, and then we've got break indices so one is just showing the word juncture so that's where you've marked the um, the words, then we've got an intermediate phrase boundary. So if I haven't finished or if I've, um, if I've not finished that group, I've not got to the end, then I might use a three. Four is the kind of end phrase boundary. And then two is places where you are not sure. And I'm sure many of us have applied places where you are not sure on many occasions when you're doing Toby Lovely because there's actually quite a lot of places where you're not sure. Oh, and I've got, I've managed to animate this worthy. Um, and then we've got indeterminate word juncture as well. So if you're not sure where the difference is between the words, you can put this in, um, you can put in a zero. Um, so this is an example of the phrase, I really like it. I'm not, um, can I play it to you? Oh, yes, I can. Okay. Um, so just using um, Prat there. I really like it. Um, and we can see that we've got one of these fun Prat anomalies over there, but probably because it's very noisy, the background's quite noisy. Um, we can see the F0 goes, I really like it. And then we've got the Toby label in there. And then we've got the um, boundaries going on underneath. So that's what it looks like, really. Okay there, John? Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, great, all this noise and stuff going on at the end here. And my students are going, oh, high frequency. And I say, yes, but listen to it, it's going, <sighs> So that's what that is. Um, make sure that you take this out of your analysis if you're doing anything to do with SEO. Um, now, there are materials for this. If you want to um, look at the materials, then uh, Vieja and colleagues did uh, some transcribing prosodic structure stuff, which you can download. Um, it has a Creative Commons license if you want to use it yourself. If you want to train yourselves to use Toby, I'm not going to do that here. Um, because as I say, you'll get very used to Mariana and her marmalade if you're doing a Toby training. Um, but uh, if you want to know more about that, then you can go there. Okay, let's move on to discourse intonation. Now, again, I'm interested in discourse intonation because it's sort of motivated by English language teaching. Have you got a question? No, okay. It's motivated again by English language teaching. So we're looking at mostly things like focus and chunking. It's those things which are most important. And in, uh, discourse intonation matches very well with the lingua franca core in that respect. Um, and looking at things like given and new information. I'm not saying that the British system generally doesn't match with that, but that discourse intonation um, has been devised in a way that is, it makes it highly teachable in my experience, although not lots of people do teach it. 
Um, so the focus is on interaction for this, and it has several elements. So the key elements are the nucleus or the tonic placement, and then there's tone and key. So tone is the movement of the pitch, basically looking at mostly the nucleus. And key is whether something starts high or medium or low. Uh, so if we've got an aside, something like this, then we've got that's low key. That would be considered low key. Um, so speakers are making intonational choices based on a continuous assessment of the understanding between themselves and their interlocutors. So this goes back to what you were saying about it's what you are wanting to say and negotiating the meaning with the person that you're speaking to. Um, and this is called the context of interaction. And it's important that we have common ground of one kind or another with the speakers. If there's no common ground, then it's really difficult. I'm sure you found this. If I've got somebody talking to me about football, I have no understanding of what's going on. So I'm not gonna get anywhere with that at all. So you need to have some common ground. And a lot of this is cultural. It's cultural background of things that you know, because we make a lot of assumptions when we're speaking that people know what we're talking about. We have to, um, but often you find that you've made an assumption which works in one culture and not in another. And so it doesn't make sense to that person. So um, you're using maybe something um, that uh, implies that you know that they know what that means, whereas they might not do. So we've got this notion of given and new information. So given information is the common ground between the listener and the speaker. And new information is stuff that I'm bringing that's new to the conversation, it's stuff that I need you to know. Um, so we present given information with referring tones in this paradigm and new information with proclaiming tones. And there are five of those in this approach. So here they are. So there's a fall, a rise fall, which is considered a marked, um, a, a marked P tone. And we've got a rise, which is a marked P tone, a fall rise and a level. And this is based on British English. Um, so if something is marked, it means the speaker is dominant in the conversation, not necessarily that the speaker is more dominant socially, but they are more dominant in terms of the information in the conversation. So that's what that means. So you're unlikely to get um, these unless there's something that the speaker feels that they have the upper hand on in the conversation or they're, um, they're dominant in or something. Um, so the rising tone and the rise full tone are used by a speaker who has more dominant role. And there's also a level tone, which indicates the speaker's not finished an utterance, hesitation, listening, or the speaker's lack of involvement. And that's something that we'd expect with a level tone. Anyway, so this is the way that he divides up, the browser divides up the uh, tone unit using this, um, using this system. So the tonic segment is the thing that you must have. And then we've got everything after the tonic is considered the clitic segment and everything before it is considered the proclitic segment. Now, if we think about, if we compare this with the British system where we've got the prehead, the head, the nucleus and the tail, then actually in this system, the proclitic segment is the prehead. The tonic segment is, is from the beginning of the accented material. So it's from the start of the, um, the tone unit up to and including the nucleus. So all of that is considered to be the tonic segment in this. Um, and then the enclitic segment is, the, uh, is what we call the tail in this system. So he's saying this is the point at which the accent starts. There's a pitch accent there. It's the onset of the head. It is an accented syllable. All of that up until the end of the, of the nucleus, that is accented. So that is tonic in this system. Okay, um, now I've done a summary of this if you're interested, um, and uh, there's a list of um, things at the end. So um, what problems do you foresee, or I think I might actually skip this bit because <laughs> the problems are many, <laughs> including agreement, inter-rater agreement is a nightmare with this. I mean, to start, if you've got something really straightforward, it's fine. But you know, I mean, is that a full rise or is it just a rise to, is it a fall to mid or how do we analyze that? What does it mean? Are we looking at meaning or are we just looking at pitch contours? It, yeah, 
it, there's so many things that you might find are difficult when you're analyzing intonation. So unfinished tone units and intonational phrases, what do you do with these? You just have to assume that there is um, a background um, completed um, unit basically. So we assume there's an underlying one, but we don't know that there is. Um, also disagreement over tonal patterns. Again, it's really important to establish parameters. So just like suggested with the rhythm research, we need to make sure that we are very clear about what is what, what we're accepting as what, and, and so on. So for example, in some research that we did on um, storytelling in, in Hong Kong English, um, we accepted that a fall to mid was the same as a full rise tone. And that's something that's accepted within the British system um, that we would get that. So we had to agree that sort of thing. Um, and you really need to undertake a reliability, an iterator reliability check. And from discussions with various researchers, if you can get an 80% agreement with intonation, you're doing really well. Really, really well indeed. But you need to show that you are on the positive side of 50, I think, really, with this. Um, but it is hard. Um, and we have had some where we've managed to get a level of agreement around here, but above this is, is just, it's really difficult. Even if you've agreed your parameters, um, it can be hard. So we looked at various things. This one is intonation in Hong Kong English. And um, I considered sentence stress um, and pitch and nuclear tones. Um, and uh, the main stress is, oh, hang on a minute, I've animated this weirdly again. That, that is really strange. Let's go back. So the data was interactive, map tasks and happy event monologues. And the main stress is mostly on the last syllable, on the last stress syllable in the data. There's no movement of the syllable according to given or new information, contrasting stress. So we didn't find that. So there was a lack of deaccenting. Um, so for example, um, a says, so we are at the starting point. Do you see the diamond mine? Okay, so we've got a compound there, but it's on the last syllable of that. And B says, yeah, I see the diamond mine, yep. Um, so um, now go south until you pass the diamond mine. So we wanted really something like now go south until you pass because the diamond mine is now old information, but we still found that the um, nucleus was there. And then another example, um, there are more of an area, a rural area rather they're a more urban area than rural area. So we found that um, we get this pattern in this variety and you see it in other languages um, as well. Um, speakers in the data also use a range of nuclear tones. Um, we found that the level tone was the most common and that's what you're gonna find in spontaneous speech, lots of ers and ums and ahs and stuff like that. Um, we found that they made more use of the rise than the fall, but only marginally. The full rise wasn't really used very much at all, and there could be, there could be a post-colonialism reason for that. Um, and we didn't get many rise falls, very, very few. Um, and it tended to be used for extra emphasis. So we tend to think that the rise fall is, hmm, indignation, well, I'm offended, this sort of thing, or, or very, very surprised, something like that. We didn't find it was used for that. We found that it was used for, um, for um, extra emphasis. So for example, on the map task, one of the speakers says, um, uh, so when you get to the end, you can find me there. And if I said that in British English, it sounds like you idiot, you know, but that's not what she meant. She was just emphasizing that that was the end of it, basically. It's really interesting. Um, and we also found evidence of uptalk, quite a lot of uptalk going on. So well, I got quite interesting childhood. We found quite a lot of that in the Hong Kong English data. Um, so clearly a, a very prevalent thing. Um, my Malay student um, used discourse intonation to consider um, Malay speaker English. So Malaysia has these three main ethnic groups and she wanted to look at specifically Malay speaker English and she used a discourse approach for that. Um, so again, it was map tasks and they were all um, teachers of English um, from similar sociolinguistic backgrounds and they hadn't spent very much time in um, outside of Malaysia. Um, and we had one Chinese speaker of English uh, because we, were, we wanted to look at it from a global English's point of view. So she didn't want to just have those conversations. She wanted to have somebody from outside as well. And these were the sorts of things that we had. Um, so she noted that 
although DI discourse intonation has a five tone system, she found that there's actually another tone. Um, and she found this rise that was doing something interesting. Um, and she called it the cooperative rise. And the discourse function of this is to express an important piece of information. I haven't got a new recording for this, sadly. Uh, but where we've got rise, R, oh, that means rise. And this is a cooperative rise. Um, and then we've got a few of these. So, for example, um, speaker says, I'm going to guide you from the starting point um, at Quest Falls. Um, and then speaker two says, OK. And then she says, uh, OK. Uh, Towards the finishing point at a remote village. That's four. Uh, remote village, okay, uh, four, okay. Um, and then she says, okay, can you see the crest ball? Uh, can you see the crest ball? Um, and then we've got this again, so we've got some more of these sorts of things. So here's an example here uh, on your left. Um, and then you can walk straight. And she found all of these really different sorts of weird rises going on, and she wanted to see what was going on. So she separated them out and measured them differently and found that if you did that in this particular discourse context um, that they were longer they're the blue blobs there longer in milliseconds than the rises that weren't doing this particular discourse thing um, and she also found um, that they tended to be higher in pitch although there was more of an overlap there but generally speaking they were um, the average pitch range was higher in semitones um, and this is an example of a cooperative rise um, marked using Pratt. Um, she's not put the discourse stuff on here, but you can see that it's sort of quite long like this. Um, whereas uh, this is just a straightforward rise left, which is going up like that there. Um, so she measured those. So she said that Malay speaker English has these sorts of tones. And she did call that referring. I'm wondering actually whether it's proclaiming, but she added that one to the list and looked at the percentage of them. So she was using this to see if there was a different sort of discourse function going on among the Malay speakers that you don't see in, in, in British English or in the English of the Chinese interlocutor. And the Chinese interlocutor was not doing this. They, they didn't have this kind of separate category for this, um, this rise that was a supportive kind of um, important new information thing. So she found that. Okay, uh, so that is the end of what I have to say. Uh, thank you <laughs> very much. Uh, the whole world of references, I think this is going to be available somewhere, isn't it? Um, anyway, but you can, there's lots of things to read here. Um, and that's the end of the talk. So, are there any questions? Yes. Discourse intonation on a cross linguistic context, particularly like here, English and Korean. Mm. Um, I've noticed in Korean that there's a lot of morphological ways to express proclaiming versus referring. So there's chokbura goyo versus chokbura. So they actually have different verb endings or adjective endings to indicate whether they're proclaiming or referring. It's very hard. English seems very lacking in that. And I'm trying to wonder why does English have these? So I'm wondering whether English uses intonation more in that process. So have there been cross-linguistic comparisons whether, like for example, has Brazil's work been particularly focused on English and similar languages? And whether some other languages obviously use intonation, but maybe in a different way, whether Korean uses morphology more in that way? Yeah, yeah, I mean, languages do use different sorts of things to express things in uh, at different levels, you know, depending on what it is. And discourse intonation is very much based on British English, very much based on that. And, and one of the reasons that she wanted to use it is because um, Malaysia is part of the Commonwealth and we were looking at post-colonial Englishes and so on. And she wanted to see what was going on there. Um, if the patterns were similar and if they weren't if they weren't similar then what was happening and if there was a kind of development in the phonology of Malay speaker English now the thing that we could not get because at the time there was nothing published on this we couldn't get any empirical data about intonation in Malay it just wasn't available so there were a couple of books that had written about intonation in Malay 
but they were all based on just observations, you know, this um, well-known academic had written this thing and given some examples, but there was no empirical data. So we don't know if, for example, that pattern is found in Malay, and we strongly suspect that it is, but we would need to collect the data and analyze it and find out what was going on in that to see if there was uh, some kind of interaction that we weren't aware of. Now, don't think Malay is a part sentence particle sort of language in the same way that, um, that, I mean, I don't know anything about Korean really, but it's not certainly not like um, languages like Cantonese, for example, it doesn't have that sort of structure where you get the particles that are giving a lot of um, other sorts of information that might otherwise be included in the intonation pattern in other in languages that don't have them. I mean, we do, you know, we have question tasks in, in English, but we don't have anything like the complexities. Work on discourse, like to make this, it sounds like it is a very anglophone focused field. Yeah, this. yeah. Obviously, intonation is everywhere. You know, yes. But, you know, how it's actually, we're all focusing on this, you know, referring, proclaiming, and actually they present something very anglocentric. That, yeah. Yeah, but, but as I said, she was looking at, we're looking at world Englishes and we wanted to see what the, what the developments were in English um, that were different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, you do hear differences in, in Hong Kong English and I, I picked up a lot of Hong Kong English type patterns when I was working in Hong Kong. Um, and one of them is um, if you want to encourage somebody to continue speaking, in, uh, in in Cantonese, obviously, or in, in English in Hong Kong, you go, mm, 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 mm. That, that sounds like you want the person to shut up in British English. <laughs> so, you know, I'd find my mum talking to me on the phone and I'd be going, mm, mm, mm. She said, are you in a hurry to get away, dear? So, yeah, I mean, clearly there are different patterns um, and there, there's a, a lot more work to be done on this, but until we know more about the intonation of some systems, it's difficult to be able to make these comparisons. And I think it's probably, we probably know a lot about Korean um, prosody and intonation. We don't know much about Malay, and I have tried and tried and tried to get money to look at this and failed, um, because it seems that the Malaysian government isn't interested in it. Um, and it's it's tricky for me to do this from the UK. I need people on the ground in Malaysia collecting data. So um, I, I would like to look at the at what was going on in Malay, so that I had more was idea of what was happening. Cross culture within Malay was it Malay ethnic Malay? What was it cross culture? The, these these were all ethnic Malaysian. So she wanted to look at specifically. English spoken by Malays, not English spoken by Malaysians. So she didn't want to include the, the Chinese and the South. I mean, there's Chinese and South Asian and lots, there's lots of other groups, but those are the three main groups. So it's Malay, um, Chinese and South Asian. And she wanted specifically to look at Malays, what they were doing with it. Um, she's Malay um, and that was what her focus was. And um, and, and she applied discourse intonation because, as I say, it's something that is looked at from an English point of view. And in some ways, we're trying to say, you know, are these frameworks relevant? That was another point of her, com of her discussion, because um, full rise tones, for example, are really low incidence in some world Englishes. And uh, one of the claims that was made by Christine Go, who works on Singapore English and also Malay, Malaysian English, um, is that this is a deliberate attempt to distance um, the speakers from former colonies from Britain, because it is such a British sounding tone. So that was a suggestion that was made because it doesn't sound British. So, you know, but I, I mean, I've got um, a colleague called Lynn Murphy who, who gives a talk called How America Saved the English Language. So mm -hmm. it's quite possible that people are more wanting to use American patterns, but this isn't a pattern we see in that variety either. So she, she added a category to it. She said, you know, in, in its, as it is, it's not suitable to describe the full range of discourse features that you see in this variety. So I'm adding this thing called the cooperative rise. Um, and that's what she did. But without knowing enough about Malay, we don't know if that's anything to do with the, the culture or or something that's coming through from another language. I think it was Abby first. Oh, no, no, I, I, I want to 
Okay. Okay, Francesco. Okay. This was also part of the of the property price. If you get put more back the uh the slide we had that comes to the uh the uh property price. Um see if I can be right to the example of trying to fix that probably the second most of work for the second yeah you agree. That one? Yeah, this one, right? So I'm I'm looking at this um uh NNS and I'm seeing this two uh, uh this is the sign for the for the rise at the end of the gap, for example. Here. Yeah. Yes. That, that, that's that's what I'm what I'm looking at. Yeah, so she went yeah, but she didn't go yeah. Mm -hmm. She didn't do that. Yeah. So what I'm what I'm wondering is if if I look at this, this price is uh, in, in NNS, so it'd be like a quantity price, they seem to occur after uh a similar rise in the previous seven from the mm -hmm. monitor. So the, do you think that, so do you have does this happen in cases where the previous third does not include a rise at the end? Yeah, she she found it. I mean we did we did say is this is this kind of mirroring? Um, but as far as as far as she was concerned, when you looked at the cooperative rises, they was they were different enough for it not just to be mirroring of the previous term. Okay. So you're just in this sample. Yeah, I mean, I've just given she, she's this got pages and pages of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, of course she has. You know, there's there's lots and lots of it, but she didn't find that it always came after. I mean, that's that's more likely to be mirroring of that um, because we've got here. She says uh, the 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 um, Malaysian speaker says okay. And then the non-native speaker says, um, yeah. And then here she says, okay. And then, we, so that's, that's kind of closer to it. So possibly more likely to be. Ah, uh, no, so what, what, what I was wondering is like, did it? Yeah. And then uh, left, yeah. And then straight, mm -hmm. So the, the idea would be that the affiliation is happening in terms of, uh, I am projecting continuation as the MSC speaker. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the NNS is giving the least obtrusive form of uh, of uh, feedback channel, which yeah. is based on co which is a case of collaboration. I yeah, guess. yeah. It's the most collaborative. So I I, I would agree that the function that is is collaborative, but it is collaborative also because it's a it's a, a copy. So there oh, okay. could be a collaborative yeah. form. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In, in yeah. As long as there's a. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, this was a while ago that she did this. I think there was some discussion about that, but that wasn't ultimately what she thought was going on. Um, yeah, but I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's cooperative. I mean, she decided to call it the cooperative rise. You, you could potentially call it the collaborative rise, but it's very much That's a kind of, it, it, I mean, we didn't have any video of, of what was going on when they did this. And I said to her, do you think that the speaker is looking directly at the other one when they do this? When they say you go straight, you know, so are you uh, getting some recognition of whether they'd, they'd understood that? We didn't have that information. And, and she and I had a discussion about it would have been interesting to video them and see what else was going on. So this whole kind of gesture thing that Bodo was talking about. Um, and eye contact to see whether there was any any interaction there, uh, but we didn't have that data sadly. But I mean, it's it it does seem to me very sort of. Um, I'm hoping you're understanding. It's this sort of thing. Um, but it was yeah, it it it, it was an interesting pattern. Um, and as I say, you know, part of it was to say, does discourse intonation fit other Englishes? Um, and and here she didn't she really didn't feel that it did. But I, I suppose yeah I, I I think the discussion about mirroring is she didn't find it often enough for it to be a thing. But you do certainly get that sort of mirroring going on. Yeah, have you? Right. So uh, thanks. That that was really great. So many things that you talked about. So I I would actually want I'd like to say some things about the first part of the talk. Uh, but just to get it off the table, I, I want to quick, two quick remarks about the intonation and the rhythm matches. So uh, I would consider what you showed in terms of the intonation systems, I would call them uh, annotation uh, systems. Okay, uh, fair enough. Rather than the analysis system, mm. which I think we, we have uh, we have a huge challenge in figuring this, this, this out. It's, 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 
don't think you need to make me speech problems. Mm, mm. Uh, about rhythm metrics, I liked your analysis in your dissertation way more than the other types of metrics, which by now I Thank think you. are just mixing the they're found to be very problematic. We, we don't need to use them anymore, actually, if you ask me. But that's just to get it off the table. I, I really like to always be the first part. It was really, really good. I agree. It helped me think about some stuff. And I just wanted to uh, raise a few issues as a point of thinking about it further. So I think, to begin with, one, one thing that we need to maybe consider is whether we need to isolate a linguistic phenomenon or whether we need to isolate a a certain population. Mm. If we do, then we're in a problem where we need to create a situation. We need to create something uh, in the lab, and then we need all sorts of uh, issues that you very nicely uh, shown. But actually, if we don't, then we have a, a whole array of options for us nowadays, which I think we should consider on, on two axes, and is whether we need to isolate modality. Mm -hmm. Because we have YouTube and TV news archives uh -huh, and mm -hmm. we have reality shows. So mm -hmm. we have lots of people recording their voices mm -hmm. and putting it out in the public. Mm -hmm. So there's no ethical consideration. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of material. Uh, again, it's not isolating any phenomena for us, but uh, we could actually use that. Uh, now, what I think would be an interesting um, point to consider when, you, when we want to work like that is this issue of modalities. And I was thinking that podcasts actually give us, so if you, so for example, you have telephone call for all, right? So that, that kind of takes away the visual modality, which if we then analyze speech without analyzing the visual modality, that comes with it, we're, we're losing a lot of information. But if we're actually analyzing speech that is devoid of the visual modality, then, then that's that's a good, a good starting point, I think, to work with the technology. The problem with telephone corpora is that we need consent in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, the nice thing about the other things that we have now uh, uh, in abundance is that we don't need consent in advance. People are not necessarily aware of the fact that they're going to be analyzed, but we, we can do that. Yeah. And then podcasts may be a really, really, really good source for a lot of spontaneous yeah, speech that yeah. is devoid of modality, it does not require um, um, no consent from the participant. So I just just uh, so that helped me think. Of the yeah, process. yeah. No, I I agree. There's a lot of stuff out there in the public domain, and once it's out there, um, I mean, yeah, I have students that that look at it. I mean, like the television stuff. So she was looking at scripted, non-scripted, and fly on the wall. So she was looking to see what the speech was like um, in in those um, situations. And uh, you know, the scripted, they have to produce a script clearly. The kind of semi-scripted, they've got these scenarios where they might have something to start with and then they just kind of see where it goes. And then with the fly on the wall, I, I think she was she was using um, what's that one where they sit and watch television together, goggle box. So she was looking at that where they're kind of going, oh my God, you know, but they know, they know they are being, they're gonna be on telly. Yeah. And people behave differently when they know they're doing a performance thing. So if you, uh, and you, you can just, you know, caveat it like that. You can say, we must take into account that this is a performance and people know that they are putting it out there or if it's a podcast, mm -hmm. I mean, I it's know that. Of, of yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, I think you do get, I mean, I've done podcasts and listened back to them and we got very kind of chatting into stuff and, you know, you, you're kind of more talking to the person and thinking about it going out and saying all sorts of things that you probably shouldn't. Um, but yeah, you, it's, it's, you do get a lot more natural stuff that way, but you know, there, there are some people who won't, who won't do um, public stuff. They just say, no, they're not going to do it. So, you know, where, where you get the people that say, yes, I'll be on Gogglebox. Um, if, if you're not aware of Gogglebox, this is a television program where people watch television programs and they, the, the program is about them watching the program and reacting to it. Do you have anything like that in, in Korea? No, not, 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 yet, not yet, let's say. Sorry? There's actually a lot of um, video, music video reaction. You know, Korea yes, yeah, there are. But, but again, yeah, no, there's, there's kind of... Um, I've, I've listened to several where it's sort of a classical, classical pianist listens to um, Genesis is Firth the Fifth or something and comments on it, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. So I've, I've, I've watched loads of those and they are kind of like, oh, and then they talk about it. 
but they know they're doing a performance event. Uh, so, you know, you do need to caveat it like that, but you're right. There's lots of stuff out there now that is, that is completely royalty free, as it were, that you could use. Yeah, yeah. So it's, that's a good point, yeah. Okay, anything else? Yes, uh, hang on, one down here. Oh, so I, I think you've had a lot of experience with not only world languages, but also with English that is learned as a second language. Learner language. and global, yeah, yeah. yeah. And for the learner's condition, I guess there would be more variations between speakers um, according to how long they have been learning, what their levels are, yeah, yeah. and in what method that they have been studying the new language. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, analyzing intonation or rhythm may be more complex. So how do you systematically categorize or investigate those? What, does it categorize the participants? Mm, well, if you do, then how does it work? Um, yeah. So the, the stuff that we've done with learners, um, we normally have to say what level they're considered to be. Um, and we often use something like the common European framework um, for, for that, so you know, we'll say they're B1 or whatever. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what level they are and they have to have had a formal assessment of some kind that matches with that in, in, in order for it to be, um, in order for us to use it to make sense of it so that, so that people reading it know that we're looking at beginners or intermediate or um, advanced and what sort of level of that they are. Um, for Hong Kong, the students all have to do, um, all had to pass a language test before going to going to university because it's most of the universities are English medium in Hong Kong. I think they all still are. There's, there's, my Chinese university didn't used to be, but I'm, I think I'm, I'm not sure what the situation is. But anyway, so they, they had to pass that. So we kind of took Hong Kong A level as the um, grade, whatever, as, mm -hmm. as, the, as the base for it. So you'd have to sort of say, um, the, the, the speakers or the learners in this group are all at this level and the learners at this group are all in this level and we have compared sort of beginners with intermediates with so we, we've done that sort of work before but you, you've got to use an existing framework so you, you could use so there's the common uh, European framework um, there's the um, that's called the KEFA uh, there's things like IELTS and TOEFL so you can use those as well. So they're IELTS band six or eight or whatever. So you can use that to, to categorize. But that's kind of that's a general English language proficiency test. So so then you would have to sort of think about what um, language backgrounds the speaker had. And we also take into account how long they have spent in the UK. Um, so there's been a number of, of studies done. We're going to have to stop in a minute. Yeah, uh, there's been a number of studies done where they've said if person has has if, if if you've got students who have come to the UK to study, once they've been here for X amount of time, they're no longer considered to be um, not influenced by native speakers around them, sort of thing. So we would sort of look at see so there's, there's lots of different parameters that you can apply to this to to make a decision. Um, and then we look at things like, I mean, language transfer actually still works fairly well in pronunciation, um, but we also look at um, phonology, considering things like um, uh, Jim Flagey's work, uh, where he's looking at categories and so on. So um, he's saying, you know, if you look at the, the overlap of the phonologies, what's going to be more easy, what's going to be, you, you, if, if something is completely different from what you've got in the language you're learning, you're, you're more likely to be able to acquire that than if you've got something where you've got a category overlap, like a vowel overlap, that's a real nightmare to get those apart. So um, there's lots of work that's done looking at this kind of thing um, that you can apply as frameworks. And I think we have to stop. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Thank you.